Good evening. Welcome to APTN National News Weekend. I'm Daryl Stranger. The 2022 budget highlighted investments in Indigenous housing, children and families, and the further implementation of Jordan's principle. But there was one thing noticeably absent from budget 2022, and that's any mention of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. APTN's Fraser Needham has more. In 2021, MMIWG had its own section and a commitment of $1.6 billion over five years. The CEO of the Native Women's Association of Canada says this is raising serious alarm bells of where previously promised investments are going. There was a major flag for us in terms of you know, what, what happened with the investment in terms of the MMIWG. A national inquiry report was handed down with 231 calls for justice. And we're very concerned that on the surface of this reading of these uh, budget announcement, we don't see where the investment is going to be. And we have a very serious concern about that. There are a few short lines on addressing gender-based violence in this year's budget and funding for a national action plan for $539 million over five years. But that is for all women, not just Indigenous. We are Gru says NWAC isn't against new funding for a gender-based violence program, but the government needs to state where MMIWG fits into that programming. Again, if there is a general gender-based violence uh, action plan and some, some investment there, there should have been a carve-out. There should have been a specific mention of MMIWG, missing and murdered, and Indigenous women, what is the, what is the percentage that is going towards that? So it's, it's lumped into this general category. We don't know where it is, and we're probably going to you know, send some letters to try to find out where it is. Assembly of First Nations National Chief Roseanne Archibald says governments have a habit of funding studies but not following through on their recommendations. Why do they continue to create these studies? and then not fund them properly. That's a question for government. You know, to me, there's a design. There's a design that has been going on in this country from the beginning of our relationship with settlers, and it has to do with colonization. In a press release, Pauk Tutit Inuit Women of Canada says it's committed to working with the government on MMIWG initiatives. However, there needs to be more concrete action to achieve progress on the goal shared by the federal government and Pak Tutit to address the 46 Inuit specific calls for justice in the National Inquiry's final report. In an emailed statement, Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations Mark Miller's office says budget 2022 continues to build on past investments to address the root causes of violence against Indigenous women and girls. And through the Federal Pathway Program, the government will invest in the calls for justice. Fraser Needham, AP10 National News, Ottawa. The Sim First Nation signed a historic agreement with the BC government this week. The Sim First Nation and the Ministry of Children and Families outlined how they will work together on child welfare practices. APTN's Lee Wilson has this story. The child welfare agreement, called Trois Sapmentum, translates to walking together. It was over two years in the making and will make sure SIMP First Nations laws, customs and traditions are included in child welfare decisions. And it gives us, you know, we with a, the opportunity to voice um, our concerns and to have a voice in the planning for any type of protection. Um, again, like I said, the planning and then the placements of our, our SIMP um, children. SIMP Chief Shelley Loring and BC Child and Family Service Leaders burn sage in ceremony as they signed the first ever co-created child welfare agreement. The First Nation says they will take measures to keep their families together and youth that are no longer in care will get reconnected. To reconnect them with our culture, our language and our teachings and the land which is so important because we say that if you if you don't have that connection to your homelands then you know you really are lost and the same thing with our language and our culture and again this this does set us on that path for those interim measures um, on us exercising our inherent right and our inherent jurisdiction. According to a press release this agreement establishes a pathway for other Indigenous communities to develop their own policy with the B.C. government. Lee Wilson, APT National News, Kitimat. 
Cities and towns in Saskatchewan could soon make a seat at their council tables for elders. A resolution passed unanimously at the recent Saskatchewan Urban Municipalities Association Convention states elders can provide context to current affairs and foster reconciliation. All towns and cities in the province are governed by the Municipalities Act and it would have to be amended by the Saskatchewan government for that resolution to be put into practice. Laloche Mayor Georgina Jolibois says there's no word yet when the government will vote on changing the legislation, but the voice of elders is especially important for communities. The elders have a wide array of experiences through knowledge, their experiences, and it is really important that, uh, that we include them. There's one component that they would, that they speak about is the support for mental health, the support for addictions, and then the support for community healing, individual healing, and the ability to move forward. Merle Morriso nearly died from a heart attack in 2016. Now he's writing a book about his experience and how he wants more people to learn techniques that can save lives. APTN's Chris Stewart has the story. Merle Morriso is lucky to be alive. While participating in a multiple sclerosis bike ride fundraiser, he suffered a heart attack. A stint was placed in his chest at a hospital. At home a week later, his heart stopped for 14 minutes. The paramedics arrived and they said that you know, basically I was, I was dead. You know, there was no sign of life, no nothing, and they went ahead and started administering CPR medication. They were able to revive my heart, uh, got it and got it going, and then over a 48-hour period, and again, this is all after the fact, is that um, I got told my heart stopped five more times. Morso says not many people survive 14 minutes without a pulse. He says a higher power and trained medical professionals helped him survive. He is getting the word out, and in his book for adults and children, he explains the importance of CPR. You need to understand CPR, because the big fear with CPR, and as a former fire captain and instructor, is that despite the fact that the person is down, you still have the belief that you're hurting your friend, where in actuality, your friend has passed. You're trying to bring them back. So now when you're getting into the compressions, you're doing these compressions, making sure that you're pushing this blood. And of course, the biggest mistake we have is we put in too much air into them, thinking they need more air. They need blood circulation, blood circulation, blood circulation. Eh? A 2020 study from the Canadian Journal of Emergency Medicine indicates that First Nations in Saskatchewan suffered cardiac arrests at an average age of 46 compared to 65 for non-First Nations. Morriso wants defibrillators, much more widely distributed, to help save lives. Knowledge of first aid, CPR, defibrillators, I would put that in all the bands and councils out there asking a very simple question. What do you have for an emergency plan right now to protect your people? All right, and really what you're providing them by buying one piece of equipment, you're buying them time. You know, you can go ahead and strategically place these defibrillators so you give people time. The members of your band, the members of your nation are going to look at you and say thank you. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Sherwood Park, Alberta. Cases of avian flu in geese have, have been confirmed across Canada, but goose break, the Cree goose hunt, is still a go. While the risk of avian flu spreading from birds to humans is low, it can pose a threat to poultry flocks. Here's Amelia Fournier with more. Farmers across the country are monitoring their poultry closely. The Cree Trappers Association and the Cree Health Board advise goose hunters to take extra precautions, including avoiding visibly sick birds, changing clothes after hunting or preparing meat, frequent hand washing, and handling their game outside or in a well-ventilated area. It is safe to go hunting. This is our message for our for our people that it, it is safe to go hunting, you know. But you know, the precautions you take are, you know, to make sure that you 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 check the surrounding areas if there's any avian flu or avian cases in the area. We need to take a short break, but still to come, a sit-down interview with Northern Affairs Minister Dan Vandell. Welcome back. The federal budget is out and that means the federal cabinet is on the road selling their plan. 
The Northern Affairs Minister headed north to Iqaluit and sat down with our Kent Driscoll to discuss just what is in that budget for Nunavut. This from Iqaluit. Cabinet ministers headed north is as much a sign of spring as birds returning for Iqaluit. Northern Affairs Minister Dan Vandal visited Iqaluit this week to highlight money his government is proposing to spend in the recent budget. Liberals are calling it a housing budget, and Nunavut needs housing, lots of it. According to the Nunavut Housing Corporation, $1 billion is needed just to build enough homes to catch up to the current demand. This budget has $60 million over two years directly to the government of Nunavut for housing. Vandal says it's a start. $60 million over two years is a down payment from Northern Affairs uh, so to the territorial government so that the territory uh, can use that money, which has very few conditions, in the best way possible so that the territory can lever other money, whether it's private or whether it's other public money. Nunavut has great mineral riches, but developing them, that's a balancing act between job creation and protecting the environment. The budget provides for $1.5 billion for critical minerals. We wanted to know, how will the Liberals strike that balance? There's going to be lots of consultations with, uh, with residents of the territory, people on the ground, uh, the industry, of course, and uh, we know how, how important uh, critical minerals are and will be to the future of, of the world. A Canadian chief of defense staff once quipped that any land attack on the Arctic would quickly turn into a rescue mission. Nunavut is a tough target. Recent world events has us eyeing the Russians in the Arctic again. There's $252 million in that budget for Arctic defense. What form do northerners want that to take? Because of world events, what's happening in Ukraine, uh, that people are a lot more uh, aware, uh, concerned about, uh, about northern uh, defense capabilities, the modernization of NORAD. Our government uh, takes that very seriously. We, we are investing uh, eight, uh, eight billion dollars over the next few years in, uh, in uh, the, the, the Department of, of Defense. And uh, I know that there is a strategic plan for NORAD modernization. I know that uh, once you, uh, you, actually you actually build the, uh, uh, the defense systems and, or modernize, that there's opportunity for uh, a lot of it is infrastructure, which is perhaps uh, uh, airplane infrastructure, perhaps marine infrastructure. So there's opportunities to try to serve uh, a couple of purposes. Some of the first non-Inuit to live in Iqaluit were United States soldiers. Iqaluit was an early U.S. air base. And that's why the runway at the Iqaluit airport is so long, to accommodate bigger military aircraft. More military spending in Nunavut is some history repeating itself. But that history also includes military waste that is still found to this day in Nunavut. Now we'll see just how that history repeats itself and whether we learned any lessons from the first time around. Ken Driscoll, APTN National News, Halloween. Earlier this month, historic meetings between Pope Francis and an Indigenous delegation consisting of the Métis, Inuit and First Nations took place in Rome. APTN's Tina House takes us back on part of that journey that we didn't get a chance to air. Oh, we wanted to recap some of the most incredible moments that we witnessed and historical moments at that. Let's take a look back at what we saw in Rome. They traveled here for healing and hope that reconciliation will begin and that the church will make amends for what was done to indigenous people. Behind the cover-ups, behind the indifference over a hundred over years, behind the lies, behind the lack of justice, this pope, Pope Francis, decided to go right through it and decided to speak words that First Nations, Inuit and Métis have been longing to hear for decades. There was a lot at stake on the meetings held at the Vatican, and one moment that stands out was the power of singers and drummers in St. Peter's Square, which is the first time that has ever happened. Kevin Hewahe from the Carry the Kettle Nakoda Nation in Saskatchewan was chosen to dance for the Pope. From yesterday, it came through the night, and when we prayed, the elders prayed that the Creator 
would go into his sleep, into his dream, to help him feel that emotion, feel that uh, sympathy for our people that we had. And in there today, before we all went in there, they were praying outside in the hallway there, and they were singing little songs there, prayer songs, and uh, emotion was already there. And then this candid moment happened in the middle of former National Chief Phil years. Fontaine's press and, conference. Uh, and it's really about never losing hope. I, I don't have any change. Fire, fire, spaghetti, spaghetti, hungry. But spaghetti, I I hungry. Yeah, yeah, spaghetti, fine, fine, fine. Thank you very much. But get good spaghetti. She she took over the press conference. Uh, yeah, she. She's at her moment. <laughs> and for others, like the leader of the Raven Clan from Atlin, B.C., his moment came when he brought something sacred from his people, this crow rattle. It's roughly um, over 100 years old, I believe. And I'm also wearing my regalia. My daughter has made my hat and also my bed, my blanket. Um, just to be sharing it with our fellow brothers and sisters from all the, all the nations in Canada, because uh, we are all, all, all one, and we all suffered from similar things in our life when we were residential, and I'm also a survivor. And for others, they brought special items from Canada as gifts for the Pope, like these traditionally made snowshoes. But this traditional cradle board was not a gift but only given to the Pope to hold on to for 24 hours. To think about the thousands of babies and indigenous kids who never made it out alive from those houses of horror. And as the bells rang in Rome, some survivors took a moment to reflect on what it meant to be here to finally confront the Catholic Church about all that was done to indigenous people at residential schools and what's next to continue on the road to truly healing. Tina House, APTN National News, Rome. We need to step aside for one final break. Coming up, a story on regalia makers in British Columbia. Welcome back. For regalia makers across the nation, heart and soul goes into the outfits they design, and our next artist is no exception. Our reporter Charlotte Mark Jac Jacobs takes us to Northeast British Columbia for this colorful profile. So that my skirts fit right under here. See, and I Shirley Jagadet's Herald is sharing her love of life answer. one stitch at a time. For over 20 years, she's been designing traditional and contemporary one-of-a-kind creations. And, uh, the shoe shop people kind of like there were actually rock people. So the shoe shop Hungarian that. artist lives in the small community of Fort Nelson First Nation, northeast British Columbia. It's here where she began sewing regalia for her family. But when word got around of her talents, the order started coming in. Then I went to sleep and I dreamt of this dress just flying like petals like this, like when you go around like this. And I thought, okay, so I thought of this and I made it on both sides and it's bias taped edges so that when it does open, you got a nice side. Her collection well, seems endless. I thought, hey, I like this pink and cheers. It reminds me of my old grandma, the way my grandma Rose used to do it. While respecting tradition, she adds contemporary flair into her work. Lots of the ones that I do, they aren't traditional, but they can be turned into traditional. You can, like, what is it, 365 jingles you're supposed to have on there. You do a prayer for every jingle that's on your dress. With this dress here, I'm sure that, th that they would want to add more, and there's always room. I try to always make sure there's room that they can, I could even send them ribbon, and they can add it more. So it's just amazing, you know, I, I made one for somebody that wanted one to be buried in, in that, and... They like there's just no words to explain making something that special for them. She takes orders from across the country. I decided I'm going to make my own little little fabric corner. So While there's no limit on creativity, there is on supplies in the remote corner of BC. 
So cute. And one of the hottest items to play with. This is a fabric panel. I love fabric panels. No two pieces are alike. And she includes hidden messages throughout. Take care of your baby. It's a mother's hands and a baby. See the and it isn't about the money. You know, not everybody can afford uh, you know, a $2,000 um, jingle dress. So I, I try to keep mine 500 and lower. Uh, but I, you know, people will say, well, you're lowballing us or wherever you say that. I'm like, no, no, I, I want everybody, everybody to, to be able to afford a dress. For Jagged X Herald, it's all about being loud and proud in your culture. Oh, this is called moose, the Moose Hunter. You see, it's, and I actually take this cord here and I'll actually put rhinestones on it because I like rhinestones. I call them sun catchers. And it's all about, somebody told me, this is what I was told, it's all about the sun hitting it and glaring off of you and you getting the attention of the creator. And the more bling and stuff that you have going, the more he's going to see you. Charlotte Mark Jacobs, APTN National News, Fort Nelson, First Nation. In southern Alberta, the Stony Nakoda Nation have been monitoring a bison herd newly reintroduced to Banff National Park, and it's led them to publish a new report, which calls on Parks Canada to include cultural monitoring into future wildlife research. Tamara Pimentel has this story. It started with 16 bison as they were reintroduced to Banff in 2017. Now over 60 are thriving and adapting to life in the Canadian Rockies for the first time in over a century. When we see them out there on the landscape and we know that they're, they really like being there. Spiritually and culturally, it's very important for us as Stony people to see, to see and know that. Bill Snow with the Stony Nakoda Nation says since the release of the bison, Stony members have been conducting cultural monitoring and have recently published a report. Many, many studies on wildlife or vegetation or landscapes are done from a Western science view. And rarely do you see uh, an Indigenous study. The study started in September 2020 with ceremonies and elder interviews to learn about the bison before Stony Nakoda Riders and Parks Canada ventured on a week-long trip by horseback to the reintroduction zone in the eastern slopes. We're not just going out there and talking to biologists and doing the same old western type of studies. We're, we're relying on our oral history, on our teachings, on our stories from elders. That's what's the new element here in looking at wildlife. Why do they behave the way that they are? Why do they gathering and traveling in certain places? So we got to understand some of that. The study revealed how the herd adds biodiversity to the landscape. The bison support other wildlife. Their droppings help to replenish and, uh, and help the soil. Their bison hair, the birds and the little critters will come and take that wool and go back to their nests and line their nests. They also propagate vegeta vegetation because all of the seedlings that get attached to them as they move around. The report calls for more cultural monitoring to be done within national parks across the country to combine Western science with traditional teachings. Snow says the community is expected to do another trip by horseback in the summer. Tamara Pimentel, APTN National News, Calgary. That's all we have for you tonight on APTN National News Weekend. For news anytime, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Daryl Stranger. Thank you for joining us. Have a great night.